today we have Will Hendricks from Clarksville from the Behavioral Health Care Center, if I said that correctly. And um, I'm just going to let him start. All right, she said, I'm, I'm with Behavioral Health Care in Clarksville. I know Cindy is aware of us in our geriatric side, but uh, just a little brief uh, synopsis on what we do. We do a lot of work with Alzheimer's, dementia, and other mental disorders for the geriatric population. We're an inpatient facility. But part of that, um, while I'm here today, we do presentations and <coughs> services for staff, uh, community centers, senior centers, as this uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting, just to be aware and informational, anything we can do to try to help and just to help out the surrounding communities that we're in. Um, today, what we're talking about, which I love this topic because I am a marketing individual and I've been through the fire and brimstone with a lot of it, is just transforming, transforming an angry client, uh, just effective de-escalation strategies on um, which I go back to, it all goes back to the same thing, customer service and keeping the customer you have. Um, we always have this part of it, the mental health side is sometimes there's not something, not always a perfect solution, but always providing the best care you can and the best customer service you can so that individuals will refer, or referral agencies will refer back to you. Um, several businesses, it's the same business model as doing, as I said, everything you can to listen to the customer and respond with that effectively. Today, um, just a quick little points on what we're going to do. We're going to learn practical ways to deal with an angry client, understand how to disarm angry clients. I do not mean tackling and physically disarming. I hope they are not armed. If they are, I'm not going to help. Uh, increase your de-escalation skills. Understand how professional reactions impact an angry client. And in the end, I mean, I'm, as you see, a social person, and I try to have fun with everything I do. So I'm going to tell jokes, stories, and all of that. Um, I've already told a couple, but um, everything I do is try to do it through humor and do it through actual technique that people actually learn, and I'm not just a here, I'm up here talking type of individual. Um, one of the parts that we had on this presentation it's just going over why are people so mad or changes and understanding why people change or how people change. Um, this is just a model that I'm not even going to try to uh, Procosta and De Clemente's six stages of change. It goes through with uh, pre-contemplation. That's pretty much when you're looking at it and, um, and just the background on this is changing staff, changing how you do things in your office. That's what I took from it because I'm always looking at things like that because I believe my staff is the best selling point for my facility and I feel that should always be the point. Let your place sell itself. But uh, when you look at it pre-contemplation, I got the part of it that is uh, not currently considering, it's ignorant, it's bliss, you're not looking for change, you're, um, I, I hate this word, but mediocre, you're just going by. Uh, then you go through contemplation, you are uh, sitting on the fence, you're looking at making a change. You, understand, you realize the change, you realize what's needed. Uh, preparation, that's the research side of it, looking at it, how you can change, how you can help your staff change. Action is practicing and implementing this new thing. Uh, it's set on there, which I hate these demo, this figures, but three to six months to try to implement change with staff. My staff, I mean, I know we're medical, so we change a lot. We change with CNAs, nurses. I see Cindy shaking her head, so she definitely knows what we're talking about. But, the big thing is having that slow, gradual change, and you will effectively um, minimize any issues with that because you're doing it over time and learning through it. Maintenance, that's that part of it, learning as you go. And relapse, unfortunately, there's always that chance of relapsing and going back to what you originally were at, and it fails. But that's not always the goal, but that's, again, they put that in there as a motive of changing because not, not always change works. Um, that's just a precursor to this. Anger slash aggression and drugs and alcohol. Um, when I looked at this, I was telling Vanessa I love this slide because someone you never know or understand the situations individuals are in when they come into your facility. Um, I used to work at a behavioral, well, alcohol and substance abuse treatment facility. I never knew who I was dealing with. Well, not only we deal with mental health, but we also deal with Someone who comes in either drinking off of alcohol and haven't drank in a couple of days and they're used to drinking every day, or coming on, coming on or off of substances, you never know who you're talking to or what their breaking point is. 
uh, just the statistics in the little uh, map shows that alcohol sedatives and cocaine, along with PCP, which PCP is not as common now, but um, those are things that can really affect someone's temperament and mood and can lead to aggression and anger, which follows steroids and Helen's uh, opiates. The, I love this side of it is cooperation versus obedience. Uh, if you have someone in your in your facility, your establishment, don't try to pull them. It says don't try to pull the elephant's leg, coerce or get the elephant to follow you or make it do it itself. Um, one of the biggest things is it's towards the end. However, we'll go over and have it here. Is try your best with all employees. Get them to re or not employees, but uh, patrons or clients is get them to realize if there ever is an escalation moment to get them to realize what the problem is or what the problem or the solution is don't try to dictate it to them because anytime you try to coerce or force it upon them the problems get worse i always had it at bradford at the alcohol and substance you need treatment that's not going to work you tell that to the individual they're not going to go for it but you help them and you just go around the issue be around the bush is the best way i could do it is and then they understand all the negative consequences with it, just from experience on that end. But uh, what goes along with that is switch your thinking. Uh, go from dealing with a complaint to handling a concern. A lot of times when you have a patron or a client come in and they're complaining, say they're standing in line and they're tired of standing in line, they're just having a bad day, they're not, they're just aggravated because of out, it could be um, external circumstances or just something they're experiencing in your establishment. Just um, switching it from dealing with a complaint to handling a concern. Uh, showing that empathy side of it. Uh, think of individual or individuals as, uh, for thank them for their concern. When you start saying thank you for your concern and actually show that empathetic side and, their, and your understanding, they're more likely to be more cooperative, more, okay, look, this is my concern. How, I mean, I'm just looking to speed up my time in line. It's my lunch break, I only get 30 minutes, and it's 28 minutes in, anything I can do to speed this up, I've been here for 20 minutes. Um, everyone, there's not always something you can do for it, but just empathizing with them and showing them that you do care about their concern. That uh, it is not just a complaint. I know, okay, I know we've got healthcare. What all type of other facilities do we have in just business <coughs> rooms? Retail. Bless your heart. Mm -hmm. like yeah, electrical place. Newspaper. Newspaper. <laughs> Any other different type things? Same. Saving love money. Uh, I came from retail sales, all that side of it, because I'm definitely used to those long lines. I'm used to customers complaining all the time, which it does happen, but I found it, I mean, just with trains, think, really looking at it, and when I had a manager tell me, flip it over, don't see it as a complaint. I'm an optimist, so I really like that view of it. It's so always see it as understanding where they're coming from, because you never understand what situation someone's going through and not might not just be a lunch break but someone might be having a rough and home environment that you always need to consider that so being as friendly and as kind as you can to everyone because in the end you do not want to upset them and they take their business elsewhere because in the end that's a detrimental uh, negative impact to you and your business our reaction and how can we react in return determines whether or not situations escalates de-escalates or becomes mutually beneficial for each individual or, or mutually tolerable. Not all the times you're going to be BFS or best friends with whoever comes in and they're mad at you at the end. It could just be, okay, let's just get this done and get it out of here. Um, the biggest thing is if anything escalates in your facility, realizing that it's not just one individual you're dealing with, other people are seeing it too. Um, that's why we, if we ever have a problem in our facility, we take it back to the administrative, <coughs> and the administrative offices so that it is not in the public sector of that facility. Clients, family, um, co-workers, or anyone around that we do that in a more private setting because you don't want to disturb anyone else that is there or them get a negative connotation of what your facility is. Just always being cognizant on what you're looking at and how to handle the situation. Most common defense reactions, so this is going along with, it can be seen both ways, to the client or yourself. So if the client comes up and they're complaining, they're giving you a complaint. I mean, there's, you can look at it on, um, and I just, sorry, I've got my paper with um, 
what when they gave us gave us these is the definitions on surrender or betray. Just an example of that. Uh, someone's under a lot of stress with that new project. I should have known better to ask them for. Uh, I should have known better to ask them a question then. So what that is is you're admitting that there's a problem, but then again you're betraying, saying, "Well, he's got too much. I shouldn't even ask him." Instead of handling it a different way, really listening. Surrender slash sabotage. You're looking at to cooperate out, outwardly, um, but you're using it to undermine someone in your mind. Or in the end, you're going to undermine them. Uh, for example, we agreed to edit a coworker's draft report, but we procrastinate with it. I had that all the time in college. I hate working with people because of it. That's always you deviate task, and people always waste the last moment. Withdrawal, you just avoid someone completely, not answering, leaving the room, or changing the subject. So nothing gets done. Withdraw or entrap. We refuse to give information as a way to trap a person into doing something inappropriate or making a mistake. Counteract. Um, we let someone know that she is doing something wrong or what's affecting us and upsetting us and explain our behavior and making excuses for it. Uh, Counterattack and blame. That's uh, pretty self-explanatory. And when someone comes up with a concern, a complaint or something, and then you fire back with fire back at them. Um, the example is, why are you in such a bad mood? I mean, I, we had one of those, not at Brad, or not at uh, Behavioral Health, but at Bradford, I had a lady that worked with me at the time. Someone was upset and she was upset. Not a good day. Not a good day for females talking in those instances. Bless their heart. I know I'm male and I've always worked with females. I guess that's a good coincide for it, but um, it's really, it's why are you, I mean, she asked someone, why are you in such a bad mood? And it was a mother coming up concerned for their daughter, and hey, step back from the situation, I know you're having issues home, what, step back, because really listening is how you effectively de-escalate those situations. Um, we had a presentation or an in-service at our facility. The biggest thing I can ever say for a facility is take everyone take 10 15 minutes and look into yourself are you having a bad day what is affecting you at this moment um always just a self-reflection time i drive around a lot so that's my <coughs> self-reflection time if it's one of those like i said i'm an optimist so it's not always going to be a bad day for me it's mostly good however not everyone is me and that's the hard part i aggravate a lot of people because i'm always in a good mood and um, and I'm a marketer, I'm an intake person, so our facility can go from 15, 16 people to what it is now, 22, and our staff is just like, what's going on? So that's my job. I mean, it's a good thing, it's job security, things like that. A lot of staff will look at it at the negative side of it. So um, just really, we, we don't preach it, but really trying to help staff understand, look, if something's affecting you, look at it, and then go talk, go and vent. I mean, I was sitting last night, at 9 o'clock talking to my intake coordinator because something was bothering her. Teresa, love her, but I mean she's from Aaron, so I mean it's always, I love southern individuals. Um, and it's really that side of it, uh, understanding always where to vent, where to take things, and not doing it in front of customers, not doing it in front of coworkers. But that self-reflection and learning your pressure points, what situations provoke me. I cannot stand repetitive, useless behavior. Right? That's just one of the things that if it happens, I can only handle it a couple times. Some some triggers in my mind that this shouldn't be happening. Now I know my pet peeves, but uh, what are the feelings that experience most uh, at work? So I mean, at work, what is something that continually seems to aggravate you? Uh, what triggers these emotions? How do you express those feelings? And what can you do to manage these situations? Um, and how can you change your attitude at work? The big, the last two are the best ones, I think. What can you do to manage situations like this? This is self-reflection. This has nothing to do with the client. Because if you can manage, if there's inner, any inner turmoil within yourself, if you can manage that on the first part of the day, because I know if I'm going to have a bad day from the beginning. I mean, I know if it's me, if I'm going to have a bad day, I'll wake up in a bad mood. It doesn't happen a lot once a month, iffy, but the biggest thing is, is you know it and you're aware of it ahead of time. And I look at it from the beginning. If I come in without a smile in the office, they know something's wrong. They know something's going on, and so forth. That, 
And when someone says something to me, it's when I go in the office, close the door, and I, I get myself together because your mood affects everyone around you, especially if you're in a management position, if you're an administrator. Like me, I mean, I'm the marketing side. I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to be the energetic, as you see, talk a lot individual and one that really tries to dictate the mood in the facility. And if I'm in a bad mood or if I'm not being, able, being that usual self, that can bring down everyone. If you bring down everyone, then that can justly affect your clients, your customers. We have families in every day, and you don't know what that family's going through. Say for us with Alzheimer's dementia, it's a different battle every day. So that really being um, on the same straight and narrow track with them and having that smile, greeting them at the door and everything, and saying the same thing every day is, how are you doing? Because if you greet someone from the beginning, they can have a bad day, but I always notice that I could come into, I worked in retail all during college, so thank you, um, Black Fridays, I worked five in a row, usually 14, 16 hour days on those days. Um, but really, if you greet everyone at the door, they can have it, those days are horrible, but you greet them at the door, they're not used to it. A lot of the places don't do it. They try to say, give them your pitch. I never <coughs> give a pitch during those days. How are you doing today? Because all we're having to sell, that they can wait their signs up about. Not saying don't tell your employees to not advertise your stuff, but look at it at a different way. If you can get them in a good mood or you can do something a little bit better, different for them, that can change the outcome. So if there is something that escalates in the end, they will already like your your facility, your business, your your clientele will like you from the beginning on the end. That uh, that was a precursor side of it. Um, is understanding that what you do can dictate how um, the clients see you. I always want everyone to see me in a good fashion, not always the bright, cheery person, but also always one who cares and trying to do the best I can for each individual. Um, so we're going to move past the initial part and go to how do we react. So, okay, so for instance, I'm going to pick on you, Ms. Retail. Um, someone comes in, they have a complaint. I mean, say you're at the register, you're at you're at the desk area. They come in and complain, they don't, you don't have their size, this is too much, this isn't what they want. What do you feel is the best way to handle that? Well, first I want to ask her exactly you know, what the problem is, because I want to hear her tell me, let her vent over and over, whatever she has to say, and I'm going to sit there and listen. That's perfect. And then empathize. Yes. First I understand, oh, that would make me feel terrible. Oh, bless your heart, because <laughs> we're in the yes. South. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Ask the question. Don't be so quick to answer the question for them like you think you already know. I and mean, ask the question because you might already have the solution, and it might be a busy day, and you know you've been asked the question 500 times that day. But asking the question, what's wrong? Or how, what, what, what's the problem? <laughs> and let them tell you, and as she said, empathize. Don't be so quick to give them the solution, but talk with them about it a little bit. Um, being aware of what their problem is is how you effectively neutralize that situation. Um, I have a lot of individuals, I mean, you try to jump on it too quickly because of time constraints or something like that, you might not get the full problem and they might feel rushed. The biggest thing is you want them, even though you might be doing it in a quick manner, you want to make them feel like you're setting everything aside for them. If I get a call, say if Cindy calls me, I stop on the road and we're going to have this. I had an issue over at Pembroke, Kentucky yesterday. I stopped on the side of the road. Let's talk about it. Let's see how we can resolve this situation. Let's try to get this person back in there. And when someone realizes that you're stopping and you're taking that time, you might not fully uh, resolve that issue. It might not be exactly what they want but they see that you're making it all about them. And you that, that that's, that's treasure, that's gold to uh, clients. Uh, a lot of times we become programmed to react instead of stopping and I uh, put dot, 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 listening to what is being said and how it is being communicated. So when they're telling you on that first initial side, look at their body language. It can be non-verbal, it can just be how they're saying it, their tone of voice, how quick they're talking, if they're snappy, or what? Because I mean, you can see a lot if you just look at it, and you can see what is affecting them. I mean, you can, if you're like I am, a people person, you can read into them what's the problem before they even 
dictate fully what's the problem or what there is exactly affecting them. But if you can see what that is and empathize with them, you can de-escalate that situation on what step two or pretty much right from the beginning. Um, don't personalize the situation. Don't make all oh, their complaining. If you have a personal store, like it's your own personal business, a lot of times someone comes in complaining. I would me, I mean, it's my pride. It's someone says something about emissions or something like that. Well, I take it personal because that's my day, that's my life, that's my livelihood. But then how you react to it is completely non-personal. I mean, first thing is, let's figure out what the problem is. Empathize with them. Uh, staying calm. Avoid becoming defensive or assigning blame. Don't blame it on another employee. Don't blame it on the situation. Figure out what the problem is. Figure There's only two issues. What's the problem and how we're going to fix it. Don't figure out where the problem came from. You worry about that in staff meetings. Don't do that from the customer or that day. I mean, Take time to let the uh, situation de-escalate and then solve it the next day or that night or whichever, just to try to find a way where you're not directly affecting your personnel that day or that customer is seeing havoc or chaos. She already said that showing empathy can solve so many situations and accepting responsibility and criticism when it's valid or when it's you know you've done something wrong. Like in the case, I, I worked at Aeropostale in the mall, so I mean, you get someone the wrong side. Sorry, I'm not picking on ladies. If you get someone the wrong size, fire and brimstone because <laughs> I did it a lot. Okay, look, I'm male. I know my size. and That's about as far as my mind can stretch sometimes. <coughs> but, I mean, you have people yelling, cussing at you and everything like that. I'm sorry. But crazy day, I'm sorry. Here, let me go get that for you. Uh, so there's a lot of barriers for a non-positive reaction. There could be language barriers. I mean, we are in the South, and we do have a large Hispanic population in the South. And I know in my county, where I'm from, there's such a language barrier in a lot of retail locations, people get aggravated really quick. And it becomes, don't ever make your response seem racist or anything like that, because there are people just like you. I mean, the biggest thing is be there for every individual, because they can drive your business. You never know who you're talking to. Figure that out pretty quick when, I mean, you know, exactly, I mean, my point is exactly what I said. You don't know who this individual is, who they could be in relation to somebody else, or what kind of influence they could have. That goes along with cultural differences, uh, poor defense skills, or poor defensive skills, making assumptions, quick assumptions. I mean, you can just count your, count your day or that issue a loss because if you already assume, you don't know what the real problem is, and you can't rightly justify it or fix it. Or be being preoccupied, reacting with anger, defensiveness, um, I hate blaming, but blaming, and again, knowing your pressure point, pressure points. We already spoke about it, but how you speak to individuals and how you carry yourself and how you take the situation, not only with clients, but also with your staff related to those clients. Ordering someone, I mean, it first starts, you must or you have to. Threatening, if you don't, I, that, that just, I can't stand the threatening or the preaching side of it. That, that is, again, pet peeves, do not, I mean, just, again, two problems. Address what the problem is and how we're going to fix it. I'm, I'm male, there's no black, there's just black and white, there's no gray area with that. Let's just do this, and we'll talk about the gray area in staff meeting or something. Don't preach or lecture, this is why you did this wrong, don't judge, don't make excuses, and uh, don't label, don't be, uh, don't tell someone you're being unrealistic, don't ever say that to a client, please, that's, or tell them they're being, I had same individual told someone they were crazy. In, in, the, in the back, I'm always, I, okay, look, my background, I graduated pre-law, concentrations in pre-law and all that from college. I've been in the mental health side for about eight years now. Don't ask why, don't ask how it happened. I love this side of it because I like people's reactions and I like people. I had drug and, we were all crazy on days. I have a bed set aside for me at my facility on those days. Um, I had an individual call someone at Bradford crazy a client to their face so that an individual was fired that didn't happen it was it, 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 it was gone but
but you're dealing with someone who's dealing with an addiction, dealing with a heart issue, and you just call them crazy. It's a mental illness, and you just call them crazy. You, that's not empathy. That is not customer service. That is not being nice or kind. That's not being respectful. That's just rude. Not another place for it. So I, I wrote up a two-page document on things that happened, and that person was gone. It, it's, I hate someone losing their position, but that is just something that can, I can destroy a business. It depends on who you're talking to. We dealt with attorney sons. We've dealt with prominent doctors, and confidentiality was always a must, but we're confidential. Those people are not. They're going to go straight home and tell someone those bad news travels a lot faster than good. Good news, I can never get good news out about my facility because bad news is all over the internet. You can find good news about anything. So I mean, whenever we have it, we plaster the internet or we do silly does with the can with it, but we call the Herald Ledger. <laughs> See, and we, we actually had one that was down south and I mean she was posting stuff on Facebook. Other facilities wouldn't take them. I mean, wouldn't take this individual who was dying and needed hospice and they wouldn't take them, wouldn't do anything. She was this lady, she is a CEO of the hospital. Her husband is a president of a bank in southern Tennessee, and these places would not take their father. And him, he died of a But we gave every, everything we could to them. Anything we can do if you're staying overnight, whatever you need to handle this situation. We all above and beyond because then that good news, we were on her Facebook page. We were on everyone. I mean, for two days straight, Facebook posts about it, talking to someone on apologize for her father or something like that, and she talked about us, about the care we gave. That's rare. I mean, you rarely have some. She worked in the hospital. She understands. <laughs> but you don't always get those days. Um, so, I mean, the biggest, all I'd say is, if you have an issue with a customer or a customer has an issue with you, try to resolve it. If you can resolve it right there and quickly, and if you can do it in front of other customers, that's a good thing. But if this get escalated and things like that, then come over here. Let's let's go to a secluded area. I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the store. It doesn't. Have, I mean, let's go out of this main area and let's talk about this. Let's see what we can do to fix this problem. I apologize. I mean, even if you're if you know it's not you that's wrong, but apologize and letting them know it's all about them. But communication. Do not ever promise what you cannot. You are not capable of delivering. Do not make any promises. Um, which is digging a hole, be clear on what you can and cannot do. And if it's something they want something free because of the mistake or something like that, you just can't do it. Just tell them, look, I can help you out in this way. I'm just not able at this time to do it. Do what you're asking, but give them alternatives. Don't ever get back against the wall and they're making the demands or whatever. Just always do alternatives or, I mean, it's always knowing what you can and cannot do. Being cognizant on that. Do not tell a person that they are getting upset. That goes along with a crazy comment. Uh, do not tell a person to calm down or that they are out of control. When you feel overwhelmed or you see it's getting out of control, start using some extra strategies. Call in some help, call in someone to come and take over for you. If you feel you're getting anger just building up in you, that's a quick thing. To, and that's me. I know when I'm getting angry. If I start, okay, I talk fast as is, but if I really start talking fast and other Symptoms. I, I go ahead and call them symptoms because I know they're an issue with me. I leave. I walk away and I get someone else to handle this and I come back in 15 minutes. I apologize for my absence and let's talk about this further. If they're still, if they're still there, if the ish, situ, situation is not handled. Um, if the person is being intimidating, um, just be upfront and honest with you. At this moment in time, uh, it's hard for me to help when you yell at me. I mean, you tell them that. Because if they're yelling, they're upset. Now they're not only affecting you; they're affecting other people in your store or your establishment or something. Say bank savings work. You come, someone coming in there and yelling about their savings account, yelling about their bank account or something. What do you? How do you? That, how do you think that's going to react? Or how do you think that's going to affect everyone else in the place? They're not going to be able to get business done. They're going to be aggravated, and then in the end, that can have a negative influence on your establishment because you didn't handle it. I mean, not saying you're going to have a full backbone, go over and just kick them out of the place, but effectively handling it, handling it with empathy, empathizing with them, and solving the problem. I mean, I know everyone has policies on how to handle things. It's in every handbook because it's been such an issue. So that it's handled quickly and professionally. We spoke about it. Really listen. Do not argue or give advice. I mean, don't try to tell people how to preach or give advice or um, dictate how they need to be doing something. 
Um, use active listening. I really want to <coughs> because these are points that I love. Um, don't side with anyone or blame anyone, especially in your facility or other customers. Do not lie to someone. Again, tell them the truth. Be upfront and honest. I have an issue with lying. I have a, I dig a hole telling the truth more than anything because I'm going to tell you what the problem is. I mean, because then and then that figures out how to fix it. And be un, be sure you understand. Again, listening and make sure you're understood. So if you're talking to someone and you feel like you're getting to that point where you're effectively having a solution to it, repeat it. Okay, so we're going to give you this discount because of our mistake. And will this will this be appropriate for this? Yes. Okay, so, and then repeat it. So we're going to do this for you. Don't make it into a question. Now you're making it into a statement. So again, they, are, they one, know you're taking the time out for them, but you're also taking that and you're going that extra mile that you're making sure they understand what all you're doing for them. That it's just not something quick and easy for them. Oh, we're going to take off this discount. Repeating it so they show you're taking that time for them. Everything now is hustle and bustle with Walmart. Let's get in and get out. Take that time with somebody. Um, and it says repeat the client's concerns and the resolution you both agree upon. Don't. It's like a contract. Every contract is not just one-sided. One-sided is not a legal contract. So it's something that's mutually beneficial for both of you. Even if your benefit is getting them out of your store as quickly as possible. We all know it, we all think it, but still, the biggest part of it is that they are, you're handling the situation appropriately. What is not reflective listening? Uh, we already spoke about it, but ordering, directing, or commanding, that's going to ruin our reputation pretty quickly. A warning or threatening, uh, giving advice, making suggestions for somebody. Uh, pretty much you're trying to dictate what they're thinking. Don't, I mean, just let them, if you're the one listening and you're the one asking questions, then they're the one that's going to get to that resolution themselves. And then in the end, if they get to that resolution, then it's going to be something beneficial for you both and it's going to be a lot quicker. Arguing with someone, it never ends. Believe me, I was pretty loyal. It never ends. Um, persuading uh, with logic, arguing or lecturing, uh, moralizing or demoralizing somebody, uh, judging, criticizing, withdrawing, meaning just leaving it alone and not having anything resolved. Um, just the escalation strategies, avoid being backed into a corner, I already spoke about it. Have some suggestions, several suggestions that might be a fix the situation. Say if it's retail, a discount, or next time you come in, we're going to give you this free or something like that. Or, I mean, solve it, but remember who you're talking to. And if they come in again, 110%. I mean, that's the big thing is that you're making sure if they come in again, they do not experience the same problem. Um, don't, don't allow power struggles between you. That can be in our office and with clients. We have, I mean, not we have it, but everyone has it in their facility. It's just power struggles. You go from, say, you've got several departments in your facility. We have intake, case management, administration, marketing, sales. It's, and then, then we don't even get onto the nursing CNAs, therapy, and things like that. We have several departments, and everyone wants the best for their department. So trying to find something that's mutually beneficial for both individuals. And I love this statistic. It's re your reaction counts nine out, of ten nine out of ten times. So if you effectively have a, great, a good reaction, something that is while you're asking questions, that gives you time to think on what you're going to say. Don't be too quick to respond. So while you're asking those questions, you're really listening. And how you react, if you give a good reaction, that can solve it nine out of ten times. That I mean, I'm telling you, at Bradford, you never know. I, I, I'm, I'm not boasting. I'm not just. I was the ace in the hole for people at Bradford because I don't get mad. I don't get angry. But people listen to me for some reason. I don't know why. But they will listen to me. I mean, if it's something, they're angry or something like that, I can take them into a back room and we can talk about it in the end of the thing. I won't ever suggest it, should suggest it to them. But they will be thinking inpatient treatment was their idea. And they want outpatient to follow it up, and they want to make sure they do all their services at Bradford. Because all I did was go in there and listen to them. What's your problem? I and mean, what's going on? And some of them, and we did have socioeconomic status with all ranges, as I say. It's, I mean, you have some individual, and some of them is straightforward. What's the problem? And then they tell you, and then step and let them talk. I had the availability to do it, let them talk five, ten minutes. And then by the end of it, he says, I really do need treatment. 
just by letting them talk. I didn't have to say a word, but just sitting there listening to them. I had a thing where when I was doing intake, all I did was ask questions. I never explained. I never gave them suggestions. I never talked about it. I'm not a counselor. So I just asked them questions. And in the end, even if it was someone that was court appointed, someone that didn't want to be there, they taught them themselves. And then they realized it. I'd use that on the same things I learned that when I was at Air School, college, fraternity, all of it. Learning how to talk to people and treat them appropriately. Even if you know they're being pains in the rear, just being straightforward with them. And asking them questions and then let them come to that resolution. Uh, monitor your tone and pace. Um, monitor change in breathing and things like that. Because I could always tell when, you, when someone takes a deep breath, they're calming down. I mean, if you're really paying attention to somebody, when you let them vent and then they sigh or take a breath, you know you're on, you're on the bottom hill up. You're on the back end of the hill now. I mean, it's all downhill. So uh, just something that after you pay attention, I, would, I do 10 to 12 consults a day, so I, can, I talk to people way too much. So really noticing that side of it is when they take that breath or when they change their breathing style. They start getting really fast breathing, fast pitch, you know it's, it's escalating. Or if they're calming down, things like that, they're going to take deeper breaths and slower breaths. And maintain your body language. Do not look arms folded, things like that. There's nothing uh, arm folded or anything like that. Because, I mean, you're, you're defensive. You're putting up a wall or something like that. I always, that's, I always talk like this because I never know how people are perceiving me or anything like that. And I always have to do something with my hands. I always have a pen on me. I always do. Um, but the biggest thing is, is that you're having that side. De escalation strategies, just nonverbal observations. We talked about physical appearance, uh, breathing, posture, gestures. Uh, gestures can do a lot to make people angry. And we already spoke about when to ask for help. I mean, because if it, things escalated, I knew where my counselors were or my treatment team were, and I know where they are at all times. Because if things escalated, I'm getting out of there, they need a treatment individual or someone, a manager in a retail situation or a manager in a and so that they can come in and take it. So they might be able to do something you can't, either with resolving the situation or with just handling <coughs> the situation better because they probably have more experience with it than you do. Um, just try, again, I feel if you motivate staff, that's a quick, I, I, I use it all the time with my staff. I'm, I'm weird, I walk through my hospital every, well, when I'm in Clarksville every day. And I talk to everyone that's there, patient or not, just to try to get someone motivated and get them on the right frame of mind for a lot of the to help individuals. Uh, because if you're motivated, if you're on the right frame of mind, just again, looking at yourself and having that appropriate mindset, you can solve a lot of problems from the beginning with uh, escalation strategies. Because, I mean, you never want that to affect your business or yourself. Because if it affects you, if something affects me, it's a bad day. So, again, I just... I thank you for your time. Sorry, my power. I'm, I'm OCD. My PowerPoint's not working. I don't like that idea. Uh, I appreciate it. And if there are any questions, I know it was a lot of information going from strategies to personal experience, things like that. But if there's any questions or if anyone's had a particular situation that they've had issues with and just they might want to talk with people about, that's one of the big things that if I ever something I did not understand how to handle appropriately. I brought it up to someone else I knew and see what they've tried, what they've done, because you never know what someone, what has worked for other people. It's called group therapy. I love it. But uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you.